past present. Where that man is going, and where he is, will be present to the one elevated. For he said, my dream began in this manner. I was the observer from above. I looked down and I saw infinite possibilities of man. You couldn't conceive of a plot, whether the plot of a tragedy or some glorious plot, some horrible thing or some marvelous thing, but every conceivable plot that man could ever conceive, everyone was present. Worked out in the most minute detail. And strangely enough, they were all contained in a prone man. Here is the form of a prone man. And we said, don't ask me how infinite states of consciousness, infinite possibilities could be limited by the form of a man. But there it was. I'm only telling you what I experienced. Till I contemplated this, it was the deadest thing I had ever seen. And yet I shouldn't use the word dead. Because something that is dead suggests it must have lived. There's a previous life to it. It is now dead. So it's simply an inanimate thing. I looked at it, and then I began to awake on Sunset Boulevard, opposite Ralph's supermarket. People were on the sidewalks. There were cars on the street. But everything was frozen. But everything was frozen. Three-dimensional, but frozen. And I knew that I alone could animate them. As I knew that, I myself was frozen. I looked at myself, I'm just like the others, all frozen. And I knew only as I became alive would they become alive. And so I took a step. And I seemed to pass through an invisible curtain. At that very moment of taking the step, everyone became alive. And began to move the sound, the noise, the action, everything. And I knew there was something I was trying to remember. What is it I am trying to remember? I kept on walking. I must have gone a block. It seemed like a normal walk, the kind of walk I take every day. And everything is alive and independent of me. And then I remembered. As I remembered, I turned around and looked and changed the focus of my attention and placed it back above. And everything once more became frozen and lifeless. From this exalted state, I remembered I didn't talk to them. And for some strange reason, I wanted to speak with people. And at that moment, I found myself in the living room where a party was in progress, but they were frozen. And as I entered, I was frozen. And I wondered, am I the host? Am I the guest? They all seem to know me, and I don't know one of them. And for a moment I panicked, for I knew the party would come to an end, and I didn't know where to go. So I remembered. I completely forgot one second before, as I became involved in the party. Then I'm trying to remember something. I remembered the Sunset Boulevard experience. Remembering that, and how I escaped from it, I walked over to a seat, a chair. I sat down and closed my eyes. And then I changed the focus of my attention. A once more place not here for the party, but above. I opened my eyes, and they're all frozen. Everyone is frozen. And then I felt myself once more above. At this exalted state, I looked way down, and here is myself on a bed. And I had what I considered a wonderful idea. Now I know I can change, move myself from its present state into the most desirable state.
thing that I would like to experience. And then I realized how impossible that would be. From this level, I can't change any state. These states are permanent. I would have to go down and identify myself with that being. And from that level, once more, play the game. And so, at that moment, I began to awake. I'm on my bed. And I have no knowledge of the dream. To me, it's 6.30 in the morning. And I can't conceive that I have a dream. I went to my library and started to make a recording of your last lecture. And something you said triggered the dream. And it all came back in detail, as I just told you. Then I said, did I dream last night? Or did I dream it long, long, long ago? I don't know. But, however, it thrilled me, and so I thought I'd share it with you. Then at the very end, to make it a light that up, he said, I went to my doctor, and he said, in fact, he congratulated me on my rapid physical recovery. And he asked me if I'd done something. Well, and said, if so, tell him all about it. So I said, I did it all in my imagination. I imagine I was in your office, and you were saying to me exactly what you said. And then I began to explain to him how imagination works. That imagination creates reality. He said to me in an elderly philosophical manner, you know, my wife thinks things like that. One very flattering. But he said, this is a strange experience. We're out driving recently on a Sunday afternoon, and the radio was turned in to a ball game. And this man is coming to bed, and I dislike him. And I say to my wife, he shouldn't be the big league. He can't hit, he can't catch. And he can't run. What right is he playing in the big league? And she said to me, you shouldn't think things like that. You should think nice things about him and see him doing wonderful things. He said, all right, I will. I'll see him hit a home run. He steps to the plate and the first ball pitched, he bells it into the bleachers. And then said he to his wife, I'll never do that again. It's too fast. <laughs> <laughs> but I must tell you, the lecture that triggered the memory of his dream. For here we all are seated in this room and we think we are here and completely this. And what his dream signifies, we will not take that on. And yet you are the animating power of the universe. The whole vast world is moving around you because you're identified with the present state. Well, the thing he began to record was this. I found myself in dream, but not knowing that it was a dream. I found myself on a crowded subway train in New York City. I was talking to my friend David, but the train was literally crowded to the gunners. I heard the voice of the conductor say, please, do not press against the doors, they may spring. But the people couldn't help it. But in spite of the crowd, I could see them individually, distinctly. And the ladies were more beautiful than each other. I mean, they were all beautiful and beautifully garbed. And I turned to my friend David. I said, David, how can I believe, how can you believe? That all that we behold, though the prayer is without, it is within, in our imagination. And this whole vast world is simply a shadow. How could these lovely ladies be in me? And the train? And the train was as long as the station allowed. When he agreed, you couldn't possibly, on this level, accept it. Then the train stopped and we got off. Walked up the stairs to the plaza. Then he said to me, you're going by the post office, aren't you? I said, yes. He said, do me a favor and post these letters for me. 
I took the letters. I said, are they properly stamped and addressed? And I casually got, because I was curious who was writing, just to see that the world's properly stamped. I waved goodbye to him and turned in the direction of the post office, and he went the opposite direction. And I found myself waiting. Were they not in me? So what conclusion can I reach? Objectivity and subjectivity are wholly determined for the individual by the level on which his consciousness is focused. On reflection, it's subjective. When I was actually having the experience, it wasn't subjective. It was objective. Only when I looked and reflected upon the experience did I refer to it as a subjective experience. This is now objective. An hour from now, if you think of this room and the meeting, to you it will be a subjective experience, a memory image. So I say, everything is truly within. Now you can test it. You take a dream, a daydream, or something you want for yourself, or something you want for another. And you represent to yourself a scene which it truly implies the fulfillment of that thing. You might do this, that, and the other. And so you construct a scene. Any kind of a scene implies the fulfillment of your desire. And then to the degree that you are self persuaded of the reality of that imaginable act, it will become fact in your world. I could tell you a number of stories to support that claim. It's not theory of me anymore. This is fact based upon experience. So when we are told in the book of Luke, the kingdom of God is within you. You can take it literally. These gods that you and I are aware of are parts of the eternal structure of the universe. You are wearing the garment as an act to wear as a costume. You are not the garment you wear. You are doing this for a purpose, a heavenly purpose, but you are not these garments. You are that being that my friend discovered who sees it from above. And to see this universe from above is so completely unlike what it appears to be seen from this angle. It's not this way at all. But you come down into this world of death for a purpose. Now, Blake made this observation, and he claims he did not write it from his conscious reasoning mind, that the words were dictated by the spirit of love. But God is love. Therefore, if the spirit of love dictated the words of Jerusalem, then it is God dictating them. And in this he said, those in great eternity who contemplate on love, or rather contemplate on death, said this, what seems to be is to those to whom it seems to be, even of torments, despair, and eternal death. But divine mercy steps beyond and redeems man in the body of Jesus. Now that's something that man can grasp on this level. But I tell you, it is true. To stand in the presence of the risen Christ and commune with him face to face and voice to voice, then to have his love, his infinite love, embrace you. And as he embraces you, you fuse with him without loss of identity, no change in your identity. And yet you are one with the body of Christ. And then he sends you. And he can't send you without himself because you are one with him. There is no divorcement, no separation from that moment on. So when he makes the statement, divine mercy steps beyond and redeems man in the body of Christ. So in my last little pamphlet, I made this statement, I made it from experience. That you and I are resurrected one by one to unite into a single man 
who is God. So here is a reflection that he saw in his dream. A man prone, containing infinity, and the deadest thing he'd ever seen. God places a limitation, and then takes upon himself that limitation, and reaches in this act the very limit of contraction, that he may then expand beyond what he was. He takes upon himself the limit of opacity, and then begins to expand, and there's no limit to translucence, to transparency. This is the world called the world of death. But while we are in it, and we ourselves are animating it, we can take any state we desire. There are infinite number of states. You can be in a poor state, or a wealthy state. You're not better off, as far as the height goes, because one is poor and one is wealthy. Not the most virtual point of view. But while you're in the world of season, why not be comfortable? Why not take a state that cushions and comforts? And so you can take a state of affluence if you know what it would be like when you affluent. Assume that you are, and see the world as you would see it were it true. And then, I would say, accept it. Believe in the reality of that unseen, imaginal act. And if you do, it will come to pass. Because the whole vast world, really, is within you. I don't care what others will tell you. It's all within you. And everyone moving in your world moves because of you. William James made the statement that the greatest revolution in his time was the discovery that man, by changing the inner attitudes of his mind, could change the other aspects of his life. Now, James belongs to our generation, the century. He's gone from the world, but he was the great educator of the 20th century. And he said the greatest revolution in his time was this discovery. Well, the great book of books, the Bible, makes that statement. Not as James made it, but how would you interpret this? Whatever you desire, believe that you have received it, and you will. Isn't that the one condition imposed upon me or you is to persuade self that we have it? How can I persuade myself when at the moment reason denies it and my senses deny it? But James said he could change the given attitudes of his mind. Can anyone stop you from changing your attitude towards the speaker? You may like him or dislike him. And if your dislike of him causes him to act to confirm your dislike and you like the dislike, well then keep it up. If you don't like that reaction, you could change your attitude towards him, and he automatically and unknowingly would act in the way that you would like. And you can make it with any person in this world. So if I am that free, that I don't have to get your permission to hold an opinion on him, but I can hold it regardless of him. And if I hold it and persuade myself of the reality of that opinion of him, and you conform to it, am I not free? I am free to entertain any thought, and if I am, and it produces results, well then I'm a free person, even in the world of season. So here, I do hope that I have persuaded you that the whole vast world, though you seem so small and insignificant to yourself, the whole vast universe is really within you. And so you can take it this day and test it. You're invited to test it. And when you get the results, share it with me. Tell me about it. Write me a letter and explain what you did and how it worked. And if you're blessed this night with a vision, I would love to hear it. For God makes himself known to man in vision. And he speaks with a man through a dream. Don't try to interpret the dream. 
tell me just what happened. I afraid did not attempt to interpret it. He told me exactly what happened when my lecture that he was about to record triggered the memory of the dream. But all through his experiences, what lesson he was learning was this. I have forgotten. I must remember. If everyone could now persuade himself you're trying to remember something, you lost the memory of it when you came this low in this tale. And you're trying to remember. What he was trying to remember was that exalted position where he saw the whole thing as dead. And he came down into the body of death and completely forgot who he really was. And people are shocked when you tell them that they are Christ. All things run through origins. If my origin is God, my aim must be God. As the poet said, you see, beyond the fields, the sesame was sesame. The corn was corn. The silence and the darkness knew, and so is a man's fate born. If I believe what scientists tell me, that my origin is a worm, my aim is a worm. If I believe the Bible, and my origin is God, my end is God. And I don't have to choose that anymore. I know that from experience. I don't have to speculate about the risen Christ. I don't have to speculate about God being loved. I stood in the presence of God. And he's infinite love. I'm not bending my head when I say, God is man. As Blake said, go on a man. God is no more. Thy own humanity learn to adore. God appears, and God is light to those poor souls who dwell in night. But does a human form display to those who dwell in realms of day? So here, you're wearing the form of God. You are God. He gave you his name. And the name that he reveals to the whole vast world, if you take it, is I am. So that's my name forever. It'll be known, I'll be known by it throughout all generations. But we don't stop them. We say, I am John, a poor John, an unknown John, an unwanted John. And these are the limitations and the restrictions we put upon the name of God. But if I would remember the name, I would know about the name. And only put upon it that which is noble, that which is free. And if I did it, I would walk in that light. So, do me a favor and try it. Try it. I promise you from my own experience that you'll get the results. You won't have to hang anyone in this world of no one. There's a simple little story. Two weeks ago, just before I closed, I was about to close, and my wife said to me, you know, here's a little unfinished business. A friend of ours owes you some money. You've never asked him for it. You've never written. You've never mentioned it to anyone, but he owes you the money. You're closing up for the entire summer. You'll not be here until late fall. I don't think it's fair to him, fair to you, fair to me. And he continues indefinitely without ever mentioning the fact that he owes you the money. I said, all right, if you want the money, he said, yes. I said, all right, I will do it my own way. I will not ask him for it. I will not write him for it. I will not phone him for it. But I will do it in my own way of imagination. So I imagined, first of all, he had the money. You can't get it from someone who has the money. So I first of all assumed he had it. And then I went beyond that. You can have money and be unwilling to pay that, you know. You may have millions. And I owe the grocery store. I still won't pay. So I first of all saw him 
with money, lots of money. And then I saw him willing and eager to pay me. And then I received from him whatever he owed me. This I did on Wednesday. On Friday, the phone rang about 4 30. It was my friend. He had to call me in over a year. He said, Are you busy tonight? I said, Yes, I'm lecturing tonight. She said, That's right, it's Friday night. Well, my wife and I will come to the meeting tonight. It's perfectly all right. So he came to the meeting. After the meeting, he said, You ride home with me. And Bill, who's my wife, she'll go home with the one who brought you. And my wife will go with you, with her. So we went over to the parking lot, and he always drove an old jalopy, something falling apart. But I saw nothing like that in the lot. And he took me over towards this wonderful Chrysler, the New Yorker model, with everything in it that money could buy. But he drove me home. A new car was under a thousand miles. Not a word was said on the way home about money. Not a word was said at home. The one who drove my wife and his wife home left about quarter of eleven. And then five minutes later, she opened her purse and said, Devil, this is long, long overdue. But I think you'll find it more. And handed me a check for twelve hundred dollars. I never asked for it. Never once in the five years he's owed it to me that I ever breathed. And he gave me, she gave me twelve hundred dollars. This is how it works. If you believe in the reality of your own wonderful imaginal acts, it came out of the nowhere. And now he has money. Things no name for him. He's completely out of debt and free of that feeling of owing friends money over so many, many years. So, try it and then share with me the results of your experiment. And now, I think I'm going to ask my friends, the ushers, to pass among you. Crackers for the pig. 
And she said, I haven't any money, Daddy. I said, all this belongs to us. As no favors, don't take it. Take some crackers. Meanwhile, I started needing something to feed him. And my brother Victor came by and he said, what are you doing? I'm getting some food for my baby. And then he added some very thick-looking gravy, three heaping uh, handfuls. I thanked him. I started to complete this kneading. And then my daughter went over to a huge pyramid of crackers, and she pulled one from the base, which unbalanced the entire picture, and they all fell. As they fell, it revealed a little candle of a four-inch stone, and the candle was lit. And I said to her, that's my candle. Then the words from Scripture came into my mind. The words of Job and the words of Proverbs. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And when his candle shines upon my forehead, by its light I walk through darkness. So I say to Vicky, do not put the crackers back. That's lit now. It must never be hid again. Never be put under a bed, under a bushel, under anything. Now that that light is lit, it must remain lit. And then I woke. Well, here is the thing, the universal symbol of the Redeemer. When I have found that imagining creates reality, I'm told it. It isn't a day in my life I don't have opportunities to exercise it. The thinness of the pig revealed to me I had not been as faithful to the feeding of Christ as I should have been. He symbolized Christ. And I knew how to feed him by exercising my imagination lovingly on behalf of others. When I saw the opportunity to help him, I did it exercise my imagination lovingly on behalf of the other who needed help. I didn't feed him. I am feeding Christ every time I exercise my imagination in a loving manner. So that's the interpretation of that thing. If I didn't know the language of symbolism, I would have thought of what am I being but a pig? And the whole thing would have seemed so stupid. Yet that was communicating to me my lack of exercising what I knew. Not everyone knows imagine creates reality, so you can't judge them. But if you know it and you don't exercise it, you are not feeding Christ. Any other questions, please? Rock, water, and wine defined it all through the Bible. The rock would be the most literal translation of the scripture. The most literal. Why has been using the psychological meaning behind the story? So you, from that literal story, you bring forth water. You're told in the book of Genesis. He came into the field, and the well was covered with a rock, a stone. He rolled away the stone and watered the sheep, and then he rolled it back again. So every man comes to the rock, which is the Bible, the rock of God. He sees, if he knows how to read, he can read it. But he has to turn it into water. So he turns stone into water, getting the psychological meaning of the story. His use of that story, psychologically, converts water into wine. So we are told in Timothy's letter. Paul, Paul's letter to Timothy. Drink no more water. Use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your many infirmities. In other words, don't completely absorb the psychological meaning all day long and never apply it. Drink a little wine now. Now, if you take that literally, you may go and get blasted. <laughs> but he doesn't mean it that way. It means take what you know of the truth and use it. The use of it turns the water into wine. I can't hear both. You know, I, I'm not hearing you correctly. It's a child, you say? Or a child? Or a 
like a child is the greatest of all significance. The child is something created. Christ is always symbolized as a child. Always a child. Christ is the creative power and the wisdom of God. And that power is always personified as a child. Always. In the 8th chapter of Proverbs. And when he created the world, before he brought forth anything, I stood beside him as a little child. And I was daily his delight. For I am his creative power, his wisdom. He who finds me, finds life. He who misses me, injures himself. He who hates me, loves death. And so you find the little child. The day will come, you will all bring forth the Christ child. Everyone will give birth to Christ and bring forth that power of God wrapped in swaddling clothes in the form of a little babe. Self-explanatory. You could have been worried about something, and you hear a voice of authority asking you, What are you worrying about? And telling you not to worry, and reveals itself in two glorious eyes. And you are concerned. No. Look upon that as the most wonderful symbol of help. But let us get off the dreams now. And yet, No, I wouldn't say that anyone stays in it. In the course of a day, you and I change state after state after state, number of states in the course of a day. But we do have one to which we return constantly. That's where we live. That state, that emotion to which we most often return, constitutes the true self, the true state. That's the one that's always hatching out. If I don't like the poop that it bears, I should do something about planting a new kind of a state or tree. But the individual planting, for instance, like the money I got from my friend, <laughs> I did it on Wednesday. He gave it to me on Friday. In the end of it, I didn't do it again. Never thought of it again. My wife asked me to do it, but it was unfinished business, so I did it. But now the Bible teaches that the vision has its own appointed hour. It ripens, it will flower. If it be long, then wait. For it is sure that it will not be late. Not be late for itself. No two impregnations have the same interval of time between conception and birth. A child, if it be human, takes nine months. A horse takes twelve. A chicken takes three, three weeks. And so seeds have their different intervals of time. That's true also of concepts. Man can conceive himself to be this, that, or the other. And then that interval between the conception and its birth is determined by the nature of the conception. Any other questions? Always go to the end. The end is where we begin. What would it be like were it true? That's the end, isn't it? I have no concern with the means. I go to the end, and the end determines the means. He said, I have ways and means you know not of. My ways are past funding out. So all we're concerned with here is the end. Going to the end, remaining faithful for one moment to get the reaction, the thrill, the emotion that comes with success. <laughs> 